Hey everybody, thanks for joining. I'm Chloe Thistle and Burris, and today I have a very exciting guest with me. I have Brent Lambert here for an interview. I think I was pointing the wrong direction. Brent Lambert <laughs> for an interview. Um, I was going to read from your bio first, and then, you know, if there's anything that you want to add, you can, and then we'll kind of get into the questions from there. Sure, yeah, um, for sure. So Brent Lambert is a science fiction and fantasy author dedicated to the cause of uplifting Black and Black queer voices in both his personal and community work. Currently based out of San Diego, he gets to enjoy sunshine for more than half the year. He's helped run five literary magazines social media since its founding, and is currently working with the Story Engine deck in the same capacity. Always working, he's determined to allow Black queer men to be the stars of their own stories. He has stories published in Faya, Anathema, Cotton Xenomorph, and Beneath Ceaseless Skies. 2022 will see the debut of his first novella from Neon Hemlock Press, A Necessary Chaos. He can, he can be found on Twitter at Brent C. Lambert. Um, anything else you want to add? Uh, you know what? I'll just add this one thing with um, the the novella uh, that I had the honor to edit with uh, Marco Older is coming out in 2023. So stay tuned for that. Does the novella have a name at this point? or? Yes, a Mimicking of Known Successes. Mimicking of Known Successes. Yep, and it's coming out through Tor.com, who I am a freelance editor with. So, yeah, it's pretty exciting. It's uh, my first novella with them. And, yeah, so, and, I mean, working with Malka has just been amazing. So, yeah, that was just an experience in and of itself. I'm just throwing that in the chat really quick. All right. <laughs> yeah. I remember that had been announced at Firecon, right? Yes, and it was perfect timing because um, Malka was a guest of honor, and, Literally, there, there was like no correlation between this, but like she was a guest of honor and then um, she kind of came to me with the novella and the timing just like perfectly lined up. And so we didn't really beg Tor, but we were like, you know, we kind of twisted their arm was like, hey, Tor, like this is a huge thing that we can announce and it's like perfect timing. So fortunately, they were really cool about it. They were like, yeah, of course, this, this sounds great. Go ahead, announce it. So we got the chance to. Yeah, nice. Because I know announcements can take a while in the publishing world. <laughs> yeah. And so we were kind of nervous because we were like, mm, I don't know if they're going to let us do it. But they were super cool about it. Like, go ahead, do it. This is actually a really great opportunity. So if there's a lesson in that, you won't know until you ask. So ask the question. True. So my first question was kind of based off your old bio and also like your how you got into writing, which was as a fan, <laughs> a fan author. Um, but I was wondering who's your favorite X-Man. <laughs> so that question is always like one that's like not complicated, but it's just interesting for me because um it changes every day. Like that universe is such a, a creative cornerstone for me. Like it seeps into literally everything I do, even when I try not to let it. So I love all of those characters for different reasons. But recently the character that's kind of been nagging at the back of my mind is all uh, magic and the reason she's kind of like been in my head is because there's a character based off of her that has been like kind of percolating in the back of my mind i tried to do some things with it a couple of months ago you know let it go to the wayside you know but yeah it's still there so that so magic i guess is the answer yeah she's in the, she's definitely kind of in the forefront of my mind lately Nice. I'm very, very casual to Marvel, so I was just pulling up pictures for myself to look at. Uh, she has such a dope design, and then like she has the soul sword that's really cool, and uh, I mean, and and then she just kind of has like this really dark backstory. Like as a child, she basically got snatched to a demon dimension and got raised there, and came back for for her family. It was like this, but for her, it had been like 16 years. So you know, I just thought it's like that's interesting, like. How, how do you navigate that as a family? So, yeah, there's something about her story that's, like, I've always found fascinating and recently it's just kind of been in my head, so. No, that's cool. Um, yeah, no, those stories where it's just, like, you're gone, but you don't know how long you're gone for, I think, are always, like, really interesting and also, like, really sad. <laughs> yeah, no, and I think, um, well, Josh Whedon obviously absorbed a lot of X-Men stuff into Buffy and the Angel universe, and there's even... Connor, the character of Connor and Angel is very much like magic in that way, where 
as a baby, he's taken to a demon dimension. And in a short amount of time, he comes back as a full grown teenager. And it's weird and it's complicated because it's like, I thought my son was kidnapped. And no, I mean, he was, but for me, it's only been a couple of months. For him, it's been years. Like, how do you navigate that? And yeah. I, I just think it, yeah, I think it's an interesting little plot point. Yeah. Um, so we kind of alluded to the fact that you started out as like a fanfic writer, but yeah, for people yeah. who haven't <laughs> been, you know, researching for this interview for the past couple of weeks, how <laughs> could you explain <laughs> how your uh, writing journey got started? Yeah, sure, of course. So um as a I always was into stories, uh, but the actually believe it or not, as a kid, I hated writing like right, right not writing but i hated reading like i did not want to read like and my parents were like no we're gonna we're gonna figure this out so my dad in his wisdom he got me comic books and i fell in love i i love the the grand scope of the x-men the epicness of it just these these characters that were different and embrace their differences and it just like it really spoke to me and um from there i kind of drifted into um bigger books like uh like actually more traditional books so i think i said this on fan explaining but when i was in the fifth grade they actually were like this kid is in the library so much we're gonna make him an honorary librarian and so they would pull me out of class and I would help them sort the books and I would help pick up books from like kids in other classes or whatever. And um, I just had this love for reading. And then around middle school, I discovered the Animorphs. And that was like another creative touchstone for me. Lost my mind. And my mom, bless her, she got me those books every single month without fail. And, you know, at that point, I started trying to make my own story. So this was about sixth grade. And I remember, because every gay man has their English teacher, <laughs> my sixth grade English teacher, she gave us this assignment where it was essentially, um, we had to make up an alien world. And I went way beyond the parameters. Like, she only required a page. I came in with, like, 10 pages. And bless her, she read all 10 pages and... She pulled me aside after class, after that assignment, and she was like, Brent, she was like, you have such an imagination. And she was like, I think you could do this. And like, she was like, so I don't want you to ever give up on this. And and I didn't. I took it to heart. And um, at that point, I decided like, okay, I actually want to do this. And along the way, playing around, I discovered fan fiction. And I saw what these people were doing with the characters that I loved. And I was like, oh, you can do that? Like, I didn't know. So I joined um, a couple of fanfic groups on AOL. I'm aging myself, but on AOL, and, um, <laughs> you know, fell into those fanfic groups and uh, wrote fanfic for a few years, like was really into it. And at one at some point, I eventually decided, like, OK, I want to start creating my own worlds, creating my own characters. And yeah, I wrote. Um, <laughs> I wrote a number of really bad things, just, you know, learning that, navigating that space of like creating your own stuff. And, you know, eventually it led me to meeting um, Troy Wiggins, uh, P. Jilly Clark and um, Devon Sanders. And the three of them in various degrees were all like, OK, man, we see what you want to do. Let's take you over here. And um you know, they, they kind of brought me into the publishing world and, you know, after that came fire and then, yeah, the rest is history. <laughs> so, you know, we start off doing collabs, but there's a question from the audience. Um, is there anyone you'd like to collaborate with your fiction writing now? <sighs> yes. Oh, uh, yes. So if I was to collaborate, dream collaboration, even though like this, this man is so much smarter than me, uh, I would love to collaborate with Matt Gladstone. That would be dope. Um, I wouldn't mind collaborating with uh, Ryan Van Loan. He's cool. Um, I would look, I mean, me and Devon Sanders, we talk about all the time one day sitting down and eventually doing something. Um, I wouldn't mind collaborating with, uh, I mean, LD, of course, but like LD is also is so much smarter and better than me. Usually if I'm going to collaborate with someone, I want them to be better than me so I can kind of look good. You know, <laughs> like let me, let me coast on how great you are. Um, but yeah, no, those off the top of my head, th those are some people I wouldn't mind collaborating with. Yeah. Um, I mean, I didn't want to interrupt you while you're going, but like, 
you know, your writing's great. I would have you be very <laughs> confident about this one smarter fire than me. Like, and like, I mean, as someone who coasted through group projects as like the person is just like, I put my name in this time, the other person doesn't work. <laughs> how it gets done is how it gets done. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's another question for you from the audience. Uh, is there a published piece you're particularly proud of right now? Um, I think I actually really like uh, the one that just came out of Beneath Sleeps the Skies, uh, Faithful Delirium. That was the response to that has actually been much better than I expected, I guess. Like it's and I like I guess I'm proud of it, too, because um, it was a piece that like I myself can look back on it and be like, oh, I didn't realize I was doing that. Oh, I, I didn't realize that was layered into the story. So I think it's cool as a writer when you can go back to your own work and see things in it that that are there that you necessarily weren't thinking about when you were initially creating it. Yeah, it's always interesting, I guess, when you go back to stuff and you're like, oh. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, because I think <laughs> like writing a story, right, because a story, I think in every, this probably is hyperbole, but whatever. I feel like stories have like a piece of your soul in them every single time and it's like you don't know just how much of it is in there until you have some distance away from it so a little bit of a pivot but you know you're also social media manager for file Larry magazine and i was wondering if you could yeah. talk a little bit about that like what's the role of social media for um uh literary magazines and so short story authors and like what's your personal what's your personal relationship with social media like so when um, we initially were deciding fire and uh, trying to figure out who would do what roles, um, I kind of was like, hey, I, I'll, I'll do the social media just because like, I mean, I feel like I do have like a great love and enthusiasm for this genre and the things that it has done and can do and will do. So I just felt like it was a natural fit to put me in a position where I can talk about the kinds of stories we want to see the kinds of stories that have come out and just like build a community. And cause that was one thing I felt like the larger publishing industry just wasn't doing for black writers at the time was creating that sense of community and creating that sense of like giving them a space where they knew that their writing was appreciated no matter what stage it was in and no matter what career level they were at. So that was like one thing I really kind of like strived for when in my own personal mantra when I was taking on Fire's Twitter was I want it to be as positive a space as possible while still acknowledging some of these inequities and, you know, harsh realities. But doing it in, in a way that's loving and not that, you know, these people feeling down and, and like the energy is drained. Right. So I was always kind of my own. Um, that was always kind of my goal. And I think I think I could say it was successful. Like we, we we've grown to a, a sizable amount of followers. And I do think that is in part to the fact that, like, you know, we've always fostered a community. Like we're not just asking you to, oh, go buy our issue. Oh, read this story. Oh, review this person. We, we you know, we make it a point to ask, hey, what are you working on? What, what are you proud of? What's cool out there? Like, tell us some things that you love talking about authors that aren't necessarily even published in the magazine or, you know, uplifting those authors even when their career moves beyond the magazine. So I think that philosophy in general has um, definitely been to FIRE's benefit. So, um, yeah, uh, that, that was kind of my approach. But um, was the second part of your question what social media means to authors? Or Oh, uh, yeah. Okay. All right. So <laughs> that one I have... Um, I do have thoughts on. Um, so obviously, social media can be a bit of a hostile place for authors, especially the more popular you become. And on the one hand, I completely get it. I get how it sucks to have your words misinterpreted, to have, you know, people make assumptions about you. But on the other hand, and what I'll say is this, and I've noticed this across the board, sometimes with more successful authors, and it kind of has always, I guess, irked me a little bit, is that, you know, if if you're feeling that way, 
maybe step back and evaluate the kind of space you're creating. Um, it's unfortunate that I see so many big authors who don't take the time to talk about the stories that they're loving from mid-list authors or from authors who are new. You know, it it literally takes maybe 20 minutes to read a short story and less than that to send out a tweet saying, hey, I like this. I enjoyed it. Like that amount of time that you spend could boost that mid-list or that debut or that short fiction author's like trajectory so much. And instead, you'd rather take the time and, I don't know, jump into what the topic of the day is. It's like, is that the best use of your social media platform? I don't know. And again, you know, I don't want to get into try to policing how people use their social media because everyone comes at it for a different reason. I guess what I just think sometimes is like, if we're going to be an author on social media and we're going to try to approach it as professionally as possible, then a large tenet of that should be, especially as a BIPOC author, how am I sending the ladder back down? How am I using my space to uplift other people? And I personally would like to see more of that amongst some of our bigger authors. So, if, and I guess to anyone else out there who may not fit into that frame, um, it, it's okay to build horizontally too. It's okay to use your space to talk about what your peers are doing, the things that you like that they're doing, because I guarantee you, if you're spending 90% of your time or, or your tweets are about the other authors that you are liking and loving and, and appreciating what they're doing, you're going to get that back tenfold. So again, I understand social media can be a harsh space and an unfair space for a lot of authors, but I think a lot of it sometimes could be remedied if they had more appreciation for their fellow authors, if that makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, I was wondering in terms of like building horizontally, I think something that happens like with me as like a amateur reviewer on booktube is like people kind of get siloed in terms of like where they review. So like, oh, I'm on YouTube. So I mostly talk to the YouTubes or I'm on, um, you know, Instagram or like I mostly read romance. So I mostly talk to people who read romance or for me, I mostly buy a lot of sci-fi and fantasy people. Um, do you feel like it's difficult to do you feel like you get siloed as an author too in some ways or do you feel like it's a little bit more people just kind of talk to other people regardless like they just like their work um I think you can if you're not being introspective about the things that you read and talk about and you know I intentionally like read mostly fantasy and sci-fi because that's that's what I love and that's you know that's where my bread and butter is at now you know, but that doesn't mean like if I'm reading a nonfiction book, I won't talk about it. Or if I'm reading a romance book, I won't talk about it. But um, I think in the same, you just have to kind of be intentional in the same way that, you know, I would encourage like bigger authors to like send the ladder back down. I think it's OK, especially when you're kind of like developing your craft and trying to grow that community. It's OK to um, read outside of what you normally do. And, you know, kind of build your skill set from there. Because I, I really do think, like, I'll use a, I guess I'll use a workout metaphor here. Um, you know, you got to eat to grow, right? If you want to grow, you got to eat. So as a writer, if you want to grow, you got to read. Reading's like your, reading's like your calories, right? Like, you, you got, if you try to, like, work those muscles, those work, those craft muscles, you got to, you got to eat. And you got to eat different things. Like, you can't eat the same protein all the time. You can't always eat chicken. Like you have to try to, you know, sometimes eat some tuna. Sometimes you have to eat some beef. Like you got to switch it up. So I guess, um, yeah, like just be intentional and understand that if the if the intent is to grow, you should diversify. Um, and, you know, not just in terms of genre, but also identity. Like I actually keep track of everything that I read on the spreadsheet. And, you know, sometimes I'll look at it and I'll be like, hmm, um, have I read uh a black woman author recently have i read you know an east asian author have i read a southeast asian author have i read um a palestinian author a and being intentional because you know i think sometimes people and this is usually white people but they 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 knock um being intentional about your reading as somehow like being pandering but it's like no there's good writers in literally every single identity genre whatever you can think of 
you just have to stop being a lazy ass and go do the research to find them right and um so yeah intentionality i guess is if i had to sum it all up yeah i guess i would just from like my perspective like also it's just kind of like it becomes a habit after a while like if you're like i want to read more of this after a while you just you like look for those authors who are writing that and it just you don't think about it as much you're just like oh right like this is this thing i've been building on so it's just like second right. nature when i'm looking for books right right um, and this is the intentions just it, like you said become a habit and also like you know depending on like who you're following and like marketing dollars like they're not just going to passively come to you like you might not just get like passively recommended these books if you're not looking for them so it is important right. too right because they're out there that you, you just have to you know take the time and really be willing to actually seek them out. So um, in terms of like books that you've been enjoying um, recently, oh, sorry, there was a question from the audience uh, of books and our series from recent years that you recommend. <laughs> okay. Um, so recent years, I guess you know, I'll, I'll go with this year. Um, the Unbroken by C.O. Clark, amazing book. Um, really does something unique with secondary world fantasy, which I think everyone should take the time to definitely read. Um, one of my favorite series is The Craft Sequence from Matt Gladstone. I absolutely love how it's a secondary world, but it's definitely in, has a modern feel to it. I, I really, really love secondary world fantasy like that. So The Craft Sequence, um, City of Stairs was really good. Uh, Jade City. It's really good. I mean that that series is good. Yeah. Um, let's see what else I've read in recent years. Ray Bear absolutely has one of my favorite antagonists ever in with the lady. Uh the lady to me is what the, had the kind of arc that Cersei Lannister should have had on the show. Um let's see what else. It's always so many books. Um, this one came out a few years ago, but Borderline by Michelle Baker is actually really good. It's a really good urban fantasy, and it does something different with um with like that kind of setting and it's such a different protagonist because the protagonist has um borderline personality disorder and is also like an amputee and it's very well researched and it's just very well done um I'm trying to think what else have i really really loved uh the tensorit series by uh, neon yang absolutely crazy world building the first world i've ever seen where um an author actually tries to set something in the in the world that's shaped like a donut like that that to me is like so freaking cool um let's see who else a ruin of the shadows by ld lewis uh quick short read but like just packed with so much world building and such great action sequences um that was the first thing i ever read from ld and i immediately instantly made me a fan um black sun by rebecca Roanhorse is really good uh also a different approach to secondary world fantasy if you haven't noticed by now i love secondary world so uh yeah not to ramble on too long but yeah those are some uh recommendations i would give yes i was laughing at a uh, ray bearer because it's one that it's been on my to read list for so long and every time i say i haven't read it my friends are like what are you doing read it right <laughs> yeah no now. you gotta read it. <laughs> it's so good it's so good like the it, I, I just the depth of the mother-daughter relationship in that book is just it was so brilliant and it's not done in um you know like i don't know like a snow white that kind of like evil queen kind of way is it's so much nuance to it and it's it's definitely a toxic relationship but it doesn't run away from the fact that there's still love and yearning in it and it's just it's just really well done thank you for the recommendations i'm sure the um everyone's tbr list just like doubled in size <laughs> probably but, um to talk about like your fiction more um so one of the stories i've read by you was blood song i think that was my introduction to you um it was published in anathema magazine um and it's about a secondary world um where there's these people who have magic um there's like three different types of magic the energics if i'm remembering correctly yeah, yeah. and there's like this disease that is being um it was like running through the city and it's really mostly affecting um the blood docky who have yeah. a certain or like a certain subsect of the energics and um to me as i was reading this story um if i remember correctly all the all the blood docky all the blood docky are gay correct 
Right, right. And, and <laughs> sorry, I don't mean to cut Oh, no, off. you go ahead. You go ahead. Yeah. yeah. And so as I was reading the story, it seemed like there's a lot of parallels in terms of like the social fallout and like the circumstances. Um, there's a lot of parallels I saw with the AIDS crisis in the US. And I was wondering um, if that was intentional or if there was something that like made you want to write about like disease and gender and sexuality in this way in the story. Yeah. So it definitely was intentional. Um, so I'll be 100% honest. I, I, I like to be kind of transparent as a writer. That story is one of those stories. If I could go back and like redo a whole bunch of it, I would definitely do that. And it's not to say um, I'm not happy with the story because I am. But when I read it, I realize like there could have been a lot more nuance. There could have been a lot more, a um, lot more layers at it. And you know, I think I'm not gonna say every writer will encounter this, but you may as a writer encounter this where like. You have a story out in the world and you grow as a person and you look back at that story and that story is clearly a reflection of the person you were then. And there's parts of it that kind of make me cringe a little bit. And then there's parts of it where I'm like forgiving myself for not being as far along as I was at that point in time. Um, but I wrote it, you know, and the thing I will say is that I wrote it from a genuine, honest place. Like I coming from um I moved to California from Atlanta. Uh, Atlanta obviously has a, a high HIV rate. So that's something that, you know, I've seen all around me and I've seen people struggle with it. Um, you know, I've seen people, the, the the various traumas that that causes and, you know, the, the societal barriers that creates. And that story was me trying to uh, navigate that. But back then, I don't think I had the skill or the words to really navigate it in the way that I wanted to. But yeah, that parallel is definitely there. And I actually remember one critique of it <laughs> as someone tweeted. And uh, yeah, maybe don't tag authors in tweets, by the way. But <laughs> um, it was basically like the story was like, they were like, oh, God, like another AIDS story. And I was kind of like, oh, is that like a thing out there? But um, I don't know. But, you know, it did make me sit back and think, like, was it kind of like trite or was it kind of like stereotypical? And I do think now that I'm a little older, a little wiser, that there are some things I would do different with that story. Um, I kind of can't speak to the, I guess, representation stuff or like, um, I guess some of the critiques you might have been getting. Because I didn't really remember seeing a lot of people reacting to it. Um, it was really like, like four or five tweets, honestly. It wasn't like because I was still like a pretty new author then, and that was a pretty new magazine. So mm -hmm. I don't suspect that that many people were reading it. I'm probably being harder on myself about it than the readers were, but that's just, I guess, me as a writer. Like I'm always hard on my story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but like I, if that's the thing in fantasy, it wasn't something I had really seen before. Like this was that's part of why it stood out to me as a story. Um, that was really all I had to add about it. Oh, and also I remember you had <laughs> mentioned at some point that uh, you were very influenced by um, Acacia by David Anthony Durham. And I'd read yeah. the story before I'd read the book. <laughs> and then I read the book and then reread the story. And I felt like I saw like a lot of like connections there. And I was curious. It was. Was that a... <laughs> yeah, that it was. Um, so the thing of that story is that there's actually a trunked novel connected to that story. So that story itself was actually more of a like proof of concept type short story. But I actually wrote like a whole novel connected to that. And that novel was basically me like drawing on Acacia just like left and right. So, yeah, if you saw it in there, it was definitely there. Like that is I guess if I had to like say what my pillars of uh writing are like definitely probably the like x-men and the worst and they like acacia and they like all came at different points in my life but so yeah it's, de it's definitely in there i could see as a proof of concept like i for people who like read it the first time it's like a lot of like terms and it's obviously like a thought a lot of thought when it's like world building what thematic system's gonna look like what's the world's gonna look like and you only get like a teeny tiny little snippet of it so yeah. i was curious if there's gonna be other like you know, spinoff stories or more work in this world. But. I mean, I could maybe one day. I don't think I would ever touch that novel again. If I was to, if I was to go back to that world, it would be with uh, using that short story as probably like the pillar and building out from there. Just you know, 
like I said, because I think I would approach it with a lot more nuance now and a lot more like I would probably change some things, too, just because like now that I think about it and now that I know a little more like having a magic system that like only gay men can access could, is probably a little icky in some ways. So I need to like, you know, if I was going to address it, I would have to evaluate that in some ways. It would, it would definitely be a lot of like reorganizing and shifting and you know thinking about like i said putting nuance into it and just making it more making it more complex and not so rudimentary and yeah so maybe one day i i don't know though um lt is requesting another story in this world (laughs) again i'm not saying no i think i just have to i have to really think about it in a way that like um embraces more experiences I think when I wrote that story, I was coming at it from a very, like, basically, like, my, of course, you should come from it from your experience, right? But I think it was too narrow in terms of, like, me coming at it from, like, strictly the things that I've seen without any, like, greater research behind it or, like, any greater, in like, depth. So, yeah, if I was to do it again, I would just really take the time to really craft and make sure that it was um i think a lot more like like i said nuanced but like sensitive and just like considering a lot more of uh, different experiences um and in terms of why i asked about the acacia thing um i think in acacia there's a uh, was it the powers of magic have turned against the um the magicians and there's like this yes. really like, gruesome um, battle scene towards the end and there's something a part of in blood song part of the there is a part where the magic has kind of turned against them, but also there's a part where like people are magicking things by accident. That's also like really nasty. And I was like, <laughs> yeah. I felt like for me, I was like, I, I really see the parallels like right here. Yeah, no, those characters from Acacia, the um, they, I think they're called the Sand Top. So yeah. they influenced me a lot because I think it was the first time in maybe not the first time, but one of the starkest times in my reading, like in all my reading where I've seen like magic just come with such a brutal cost to it. It was like every single spell that these guys did to try to help just went completely haywire and did the most awful things. Like I think there's a part of the story where they're trying to help the population get over a drug addiction. So they send out this spell that's supposed to help people wean off of the drug. But the weaning is full-blown nightmares that leave people so messed up after every time they use the drug. They, Yeah, they wean off of it because they, they're having these brutal, horrible nightmares. And the, and the wizards are like, mm, wasn't our intent. Sorry. <laughs> so, yeah. Or, or just the fact that, like, they would display, you know, bursts of emotion. And these bursts of emotion would cause spells to, to rip apart the world. Like, they literally... Tore apart, in, uh, a tore apart a continent because they were pissed off. <laughs> it was, and so I was just really fascinated. And it, it definitely leaks into some of my other work too, like magic that, you know, isn't always controllable. Mm-hmm. Uh, so another of your stories I read recently was Faithful Delirium, um, which might have a little, you know, magic or at least some other things <laughs> being taken out of context and going beyond control. It's about this... Um, group of um, zealots whose goddess has recently fallen ill and she's reached, giving these proclamations. They just have been like pillaging the land, trying to find a cure for her. And um, something I was struck by was like the protagonists in the story are like very, I think deplorable people. Like I don't think many people are gonna like them as I read. And also they're, they're very like, simple i don't know if i'd say simple minded but like they're very dedicated they're like very like one track minded and i was wondering if it's like difficult to write these type of characters uh do you feel like sometimes it feels like they might be unrealistic and then you have to like i don't know like find something to make them feel like people or that's what's that like so for me um it wasn't that it was hard to write them in fact it was too easy to write them because I know those people like, you know, it it, ask any queer person who grew up in in a religious background in the South of all places. Those people are exist left and right. Those kind of single minded, um, religious, like unwaverable people 
exist existed all around me. So it was sadly too easy to write these characters because I had so many examples to draw from. Like, and I'm even within my own extended family, like it, it was not hard to write these characters, unfortunately, because as I think many people know, especially if you're like any kind of queer identity and you're running into religion, um, you know these people who refuse to see you as people and they refuse to see beyond anything that doesn't align with their doctrine. So unfortunately, those characters were not in the slightest bit hard to write. They were super easy to write. Is it difficult to write them as protagonists, I guess, like where you have to spend so much time with them? Um, on a craft level, not so much on a personal level. Yes, it is very hard. Um, it was very hard for me to like write these people and like try to not even understand them, but just to like carry them through a whole story because you're right. They're deplorable people. They're horrible. Like they're absolutely horrible. There's nothing about them that, um, I think of and, and, think that they're redeemable in any way and you know I think for me what got me through it was that thinking of the story less as like a story where people have to relate but more a story where I treat I treat it more cautionary like watch out for these people be careful of these people recognize these people in your in your circles and you know and I think especially in America, let's just be honest, like there's plenty of vulgrams running around. We see them in politics. We see them in entertainment. We see them even in publishing. Like <laughs> we see these people who have these single minded goals and anyone that stands in the way of that goal is not human. They do not count. And so, um, yeah, on a personal level, it's kind of hard because it's like you have to you had to kind of, I kind of had to like dig through some trauma to write these characters. So yeah, in that respect, it was tough, but on a craft level, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say it was super hard. Mm. I guess what was your favorite thing about writing this story? So, okay. So like that, the actual original inspiration for the story was um Ebony Ma from Infinity War. So I found that character fascinating because of like this, this, dedication to to the most horrible things like in the opening scene where he's like walking through the bodies of the asgardians and he was like you should all be grateful why are you why are you in pain why are you moaning like you get to sacrifice yourself for thanos what an honor and i was like whoa <laughs> this character there's something here and it just needled its way into my into my head and and then there was um there was this other element from an entirely different book. So my brain is kind of like a big, like gumbo soup stuff just gets thrown in there and it gets cooked up until something like starts tasting good. So, um, there's this character from the powder mage series and he was a God, but he had this bullet wound. And because he had this bullet wound, it was driving him crazy because he couldn't get rid of it. He couldn't heal. He was just in constant pain. So I thought, Somehow, I don't know how these two wires connected, but I was like, what if a character like Ebony Ma served a character like this God? And and then I started working on the story. And then as I was um, working on the story, that's when I started realizing like, oh, I'm actually talking about religion here too and fanaticism and digging into that. So, but it was fun because I love the character Ebony Ma. I thought he was really cool. I thought he was interesting. And um, yeah, it was fun getting to write that. And it was also fun... I'm not going to lie. The part where he gets his comeuppance, like that part was so satisfying for me. Like, I think I wrote the whole story just to get to that part where like he had to face the fact that like, no, you're not as brilliant and as prophetic as you think you are. And here's me telling you why. Like that part to me, I think was the most fun part of the story. Mm. Yeah, I, I don't know. Like for me, as I was reading it, I was just kind of like, I don't know. Like for me, I think it was like so hard, I guess, to write people I don't like or even, I don't know. Cause it's just like, I feel like I, 
they become like caricatures, you know? Like I just like put everything I don't like in this one person and it feels like, okay, now like, come on now. Like it's all like yeah. that, but I don't know. I guess that's why I asked. Oh. Well, I guess I for mean, me- It's also like, you know, if you, when, if it's everywhere, it's kind of like, it just is what it is, you know? Well, I guess for me too, like, and this is something I think black people can definitely relate to. Um, we may not like a lot about white culture, but we have to know a lot about it in order to survive, in order to get out of dangerous situations, in order to not find ourselves in dangerous situations. So, and I think it's also the same rings true for any um, queer person who had to navigate uh, a religious environment that wasn't friendly to them. Like you, you learn how to survive, you learn these people and the things that they say and do. So it, is not so much sympathy or empathy. It's just like, I just drew on like knowing those people because like I had to survive them. And so that's what I wrote. Like it, it was like, okay, well, you know, I know when this person starts talking about aberrations or abominations, you know, I know what they're really saying. Or like, you know, I, I you know, the, the key words, the code words. And so that's more so what I was drawing on because I think, like to your point is not is not they're not characters you want to sympathize with and you don't want to get in the space where you are sympathizing with them and i think sometimes um we're uh fiction writers sometimes we get hung up on this idea of um relatability and sympathy and i think that's part of the industry too unfortunately they kind of like harp on that but you know i I, I'm just going to write the character as it needs to be written and, you know, and go from there. And yeah. No, thank you for that perspective. Um, another uh, work of yours I had read was um, Vanity Moon Worms, which was a flash fiction published yeah. in Baffling Magazine, which is about this um, man, Cletus, who's like a newcomer to town. He goes to this like mysterious gay bar and I mean, it is what it seems on the outside, and also there's like a little bit more to it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, and I was wondering, first of all, Cletus is like a very distinctive name. Like, I don't think, I don't know. I feel like for me, it's like one of those archetypal names where it's like people mean something when they use that name, but I personally don't know anyone with that name. Like when people like say Mary Sue or something like that, you know? Like, right. I don't right. actually know Mary Sue. Um, I'm right. just curious why you picked that name for this character. So. The reason I click, um, not click. Sorry. The reason I picked that name was, um, I wanted a name that, because this is actually that per, that flash piece is actually a very personal piece. So I wanted a name that was like that felt distinctly black Southern. Like I wanted that, and I wanted you know, I wanted a name that like people who aren't from the South would see that name and us uh, make some assumptions about the character, right? Like. People who are maybe, you know, from other parts of the country will hear Cletus and they think in country bumping. All right. You know, they're thinking like, oh, this is like some uh, some old school church guy, you know. So I wanted a name that like would evoke certain emotions and certain like certain cues right away, just because I knew it was a flash piece and I knew I needed to convey a lot without saying a lot. So that's kind of why I leaned into the name of Cletus. And in terms of like what inspired like the story and like I'm, I guess you can't really talk about like the ending too much, but like specifically like the club setting and like you know why are there why is it worms that people are eating and like all this stuff? Is there anything you could talk about about that? Yeah, so like like kind of like what I said, this this piece was like super personal. So um, when I first moved out here to California, like one of the things I just quickly latched onto was like, oh my God, everybody out here is really pretty and really fit and like really like nice looking, like what the hell? And and at the time, you know, I didn't have the, the greatest self image. So, you know, I used to have like a, not a lot of negative self-talk about like not feeling attractive, not feeling like, not feeling good enough to fit in out here and, you know, really, really questioning myself about like, was this the right choice coming out here? And, you know, and especially um, being gay, like there's definitely this pressure to fit a certain aesthetic and to, you know, 
just look a certain way, dress a certain way, so on and so forth. And at the time, like, I just didn't feel like I fit into any of that. Like, I just kind of felt like a complete and total outsider to this uh, Southern California kind of culture. So in that respect, that's kind of what this story is drawing on. Like, you know, that feeling of just not fitting in and not being like, not being pretty enough and not being attractive enough, not having that, that like sexual energy that's people were putting off you know so it was it was um yeah i was definitely drawing from that when i when i wrote it and uh as to like why worms because now that i'm now that i've lived here for like seven years and now that you know i've definitely done some like self-exploration some self-growth some growth or whatever i just realized like all of that stuff like underneath the surface it's all really very like toxic and ugly and kind of gross and just not like not healthy and so i use worms to kind of like symbolize like okay this is gross this isn't actually something to attain aspire to this isn't something that you should actually like actively seek out so yeah like i said i was really trying to do <laughs> as much as i could with as little as possible was it like a pretty rough transition going from like short stories to flash or was it pretty seamless um it was a bit of a transition just because like i'm a world builder i love world building it's kind of like why i fell into secondary fantasy secondary world fantasy so much is because i love the idea of like creating an entirely new world and like exploring it and building it out and imagining all these different aspects to it so i had to kind of temper that a little bit with the flash piece because again you can only do so much so i couldn't like drop a whole bunch of city names i couldn't drop like magic systems i couldn't drop uh religions and all that stuff i had to be very precise in terms of like what am i giving the audience why am i giving it to them so it, it wasn't hard but it did like require me to like kind of like really assess some of my worst impulses and you know really be careful about not letting those override the story okay um yeah it's just interesting because i've only really recently started reading flash like i think baffling magazine is why i started reading flash like more regularly and so it's just like a very short amount of space to do a do a story with and if people haven't read baffling magazine i really recommend it they're doing a bind up of the all the stories released this year that you can get for pre-order on Neon Hemlock's website. But no, when I feel like good flash, like when it's good, it's like super, super good. Yeah. Yeah. Baffling has done some really good flash fiction. And I was like super, I was actually really, really happy that like Dave approached me because it, it did force me to kind of challenge myself a little bit, but also too, it was my first ever cover art, so it was really cool that the uh, the cover artist chose my story to actually do the cover for Baffling for. So that was actually like kind of like a big moment for me. I was like, ah, I got artwork. This is really cool. So yeah, no, it was um, and, and it actually I think the story um got recommended by Alex Brown on Tor.com, which was cool because like what like five years ago, being on Tor.com for anything felt like basically being asked to travel to Alpha Centauri. So that was like, you know, it just felt impossible. But yeah, so uh, yeah, it was, it, it, I'm overall happy with how that story was received. Nice. Well, congrats on, I didn't know that the cover was based on your story. So I'm yeah. definitely going to go back and looking for details now. Yeah, like it was cool. Like he, um, I, he, he drew uh, the, the necromancer and I cannot remember his name, but I know his name's in the story. Um, so yeah, he kind of drew on him. And so I was like, ah, oh, this is cool. Yeah. Oh, there's an audience question. Any advice for aspiring fiction writers? Sure. Um, <clears throat> so what I always say with any advice is, and I mean this about anything with writing, take what works for you and chuck out the rest. So if anything I say doesn't work for you, don't think that that means something's wrong with your process because it doesn't. It just means that like, what I do doesn't necessarily fit in in what you do. Um, so with that, like disclaimer out the way, uh, read, just read voraciously, like read, consume, and also to look for story in look for story in everything, really. Like um, the TV shows you watch, like I think How to Get Away with Murder taught me so much about plot 
and how to structure your moments and your scenes in such a way for maximum effect. Um, I, yeah, so I, I just, even video games, video games tell you stuff about story. Let's just like look for, look for storytelling in everything you consume. And that's something I've always done. And, you know, I will say this, it will have the unfortunate side effect that it will make it hard for you to just enjoy things because your, your mind's eye will start picking up on everything. But, you know, that's kind of, I guess, the cost of entry for us fiction writers is that, you know, we kind of lose that um, enjoyment of entertainment sometimes. Um, what I would also say, too, is not everything needs to be published. It's OK to just write things that are solely for you, things that will never see the light of day. And and if, you know, it's OK to have a whole novel that is just sitting somewhere it's okay to have a bunch of short stories that never really do anything because every word is a building block. Um, every word is going for in the growth of yourself as a writer. So yeah, don't be afraid to just write for the sake of writing. Not everything needs to be something you want to publish and not everything needs to be published. Honestly, it's okay to have things that are just for you or just for a group of friends. Like that's, there's nothing wrong with that. I think, um, Publishing, unfortunately, can sometimes put this like hustle mentality on us where it's like, finish this, so you can put this to this magazine, finish this, so you can throw it in the back magazine. It's like, it's okay to just play. Like, that's that's fine. Um, what else would I say? Um, make friends if, if, if that's something you can do, because there's nothing like having um, a writing friend that will tell you, like, you can do this. Don't beat yourself up. This story is actually good. You know, are on the flip side, like I think it's very powerful to have people that you can help uplift, because for me, um, some of my biggest growth as a writer has been when I've read and critiqued the writings of other people, because it kind of teaches you like what um, what you're good at, what you could kind of work on and the things that other people are good at and how they do it are the things that they're not so good at. That you realize like, oh, I'm, I'm actually OK at that. So, yeah, like build a circle, build people around you that, you know, you can talk to. And honestly, I, I think writing is definitely a solitary thing. But most of us are looking for community to some degree. So it's OK to reach out to people. I actually, you've had people reach out to me and was like, hey, can I ask you a question or, hey, can I um, possibly throw this story at you? And yeah, I, I think that just don't be afraid to um, build community. And if I had anything else, I guess like this is something I personally do. Um, I actually keep a whole writing document. So whenever I see someone drop some cool advice on Twitter or if I listen to a panel when someone says something really cool, I write it all down in a document and I save it. So and I, I break it out in terms of like this is editing advice. This is drafting advice. This is like world building advice. And Whenever I do get stuck in a project, I'll pull that document up and I'll, you know, tend to find something that like kind of like, oh, I forgot that person said that. Yeah. Let me use this method or let me try this trick. So, yeah, I, that would be my advice. Thank you for sharing that. Um, sorry. So uh, LP took one of my later questions, but I, in terms of talking about, I guess, edits and stuff, is there like an edit that's particularly difficult for you to make or a type of edit that is particularly hard for you to incorporate into your writing? Um, shoot. Uh, if I had to think of one edit. Um, so there was uh, actually, th this is like a unpublished work, but so one of the hardest edits I've ever had to do is um in this novel that uh, I was querying a few years back where I actually had to, I had to kill this one character and I did not want to because I absolutely adored the character. But for, you know, for, for it to have the impact that I wanted it to have and to show like this world I built really had like dire consequences to it, this character had to go. And they didn't die in the first draft. It was when I was revising, I was like, hmm. OK, got to do it. And, you know, and I did it. And um, the story was better for it, for sure. But it sucked because I like really like the character. And in my head, you know, because I mean, 
some of us writers, we have these grand visions. I was like, yeah, this character's going to be in book two, three, blah, blah, blah. And no, they had to go first first time out the gate. So <laughs> yeah, that was uh, probably like the hardest edit. You couldn't like bring in some of the, you know, the superhero stuff where no one really stays dead, like talk to them in the afterlife. I could. <laughs> <laughs> Do some resurrections or some clones or something, but yeah. <laughs> Oh, and I was uh, curious, is there like an interview question you've always wanted to be asked, like, or something in your work where you're like, ooh, I wonder if anyone's ever going to notice this? And um, you know, uh, one thing I guess I've always wanted to be asked is like, you know, like, how would you like your work to be remembered, I guess? I feel like that's like, uh, I know it's like a grand question. I really don't have like a body of work, I guess, that justifies that question yet. but um. Yeah, that's just always one I've kind of wanted to be asked, though. So do I got to answer it now that I said it out loud? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. So I guess I would want my work to be remembered as, like, authentic and, like, you know, and coming from an honest place, even when the work isn't necessarily perfect. Because, like, I think that there's a world of difference between trying to be perfect and and um chasing perfect right like i think when you try to be perfect that's when you get stuck and 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 you're you're hard on yourself and you get stuck in this perfectionism whereas like chasing perfect is like you understand that there's always room to grow like this last thing i did was cool but there's ways to be better and i think i would like my work to be remembered that way too like i want people to be like yeah, you know, this story had some flaws, but you could tell, like, Brent was always trying to chase that perfect story. So, yeah, if I had to have people remember it, I would like that. I feel like that's just, like, inevitable, though, you know? Like, you just grow as an author. <laughs> yeah, there's always growth. It's always, And the part that sucks is, like, as you grow, like you start, it's harder to get past seeing your flaws. So it's like, you'll be drafting and it's like, I know that could be better, but I got to keep going or I'm never going to finish. So um, yeah, that's, that's the, that's the part about growth. And um, there's always, I guess back to aspiring, I'll say this too. Uh, it's okay if you get to a point in your writing where you know something's wrong but you know you don't have the skill to fix it yet because that's going to happen. Because unfortunately, sometimes your mind and the, your mind's eye moves faster than your actual growth as a writer. So you will get to a point where you'd be like, Ugh, that particular characterization is not as nuanced as I wish it could be, but I just don't have the skill as a writer to do to, to do it. And that doesn't mean you're, you're stagnant or you failed. It just means that you're growing. And eventually, if you keep at it, to use, a, I guess, another gym metaphor, you may hit a plateau. That doesn't mean you quit going to the gym. It just means you hit a plateau. You keep being consistent. You keep doing what you got to do. And eventually, you'll break it. So, yeah, I guess that's an addendum to aspiring fiction. It's just, like, really interesting, I guess, as, like, someone who's, like, kind of is, like, passively reading stuff, like, I don't know, like I, like hobby, you know, do like fanfic or something like that, but who isn't like necessarily trying to be published and like, just like <laughs> the perspective on people's work as opposed to people who are like, you know, putting in like the years of effort it takes to actually see the fruition and like people are like really dedicated to the craft in terms of like their perspective on their work. It's just very interesting. So I've also yeah. heard like visual artists talk about like that, that plateau between like what they're able to draw and like what they, the flaws they see in their work. Yeah. Yeah. And it definitely happens with fiction. And um, it's not a bad thing. It, you're going to go through it. It, it just got to keep being consistent, keep showing up, uh, and, and you'll, you'll get past it. Thank you for sharing that. Um, so last question I had planned was, we mentioned a little bit the 2022 Neon Hemlock Plus novella, Necessary Chaos. Um, so I was very sad when it was announced that we don't have covers yet, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Look, all I could say is because I haven't I haven't actually seen the cover yet, but the artist that agreed to it is so dope. I I did not think that they would agree, but Dave worked his magic and he got them to agree. And all I can say is if if 
that cover is any measure of what they've done in the past. I'm going to frame that thing somewhere. It's 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 gonna be good. So it's gonna be worth the wait. I I mean I'm over here on pins and needles too, trust me, because I wanna know. Like I want to see what I'm working with. But um in the meantime, I'm just focused on trying to finish this draft of it so I can get into the real like meat of editing it and making it better because Jesus, it needs some editing. But <laughs> uh yeah, so don't cover yet. Um hopefully soonish. Uh I know Dave is like swamped with some things right now. So probably not until like early next year maybe. But um yeah it's happening. It's gonna be cool. I'm super excited about it. And uh yeah the story itself um yeah we'll see what happens with that. I hope the story lives up to the cover. We'll see. Can you tell us a little bit about it? I know there was like a synopsis that was released, but it's a yeah, moment. yeah, for sure. Um, so the 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 premise of the story is that it's um it's definitely it's a secondary world. Um, there's like three major empires uh, that you know kind of run this world, you know, and they run it through proxy sometimes by like controlling smaller nations, uh, you know, using using CIA analogs, FBI analogs to uh, kind of like control these nations and, you know, control their resources and so on and so forth. So in the midst of this, there's a lot of um, anarchist groups that, you know, pretty much preach, hey, take down these empires. Um, we're going to build a better world once they're gone. So, you know, they're called anarchists by some, they're called terrorists by others, but, you know, these groups exist. And so the story is about basically a character who's part of one of these anarchist groups and a character who's part of one of these imperial like CIA analogs. So they're like basically spying on each other and they've been doing it for years and they do it through this like pseudo relationship. So in, um, in the process, they actually end up falling for each other. And right as they're getting to a point where they're thinking okay, maybe I need to deal with my feelings for this person. They both kind of get the order to kill the other one. So the story is kind of like about what happens when they get that decision, what choices do they make? And, you know, if, if anything real can come out of all these lies that they've been telling each other. And so, yeah, it's kind of like, I think of it as like Mr. and Mrs. Smith, but like with, with magic and uh, and you know gayness and blackness so yeah no i was very excited i'm always very excited when neon hemlock announces their novella lineups but like i'm always like if they get here faster can they get here faster <laughs> <laughs> i promise i'm writing I'm, I'm like writing every day i'm just like trying to like get this draft done and like so i can see what i'm working with and build from there um yeah like i was i tweeted it yesterday but i actually finally got the right scene where like they actually like really get to throwing blows with each other and i was like oh finally i'm here so um yeah i'm working on it i promise and you know i'm, I'm excited about it uh i'm also a little nervous just because this is my first thing being published that is in a short story so i'm going to definitely have to um i'm having to put on like uh a lens that i haven't before like it's, I think it's it's entirely different when like you're drafting a novel in the background and you have a hope of someday it being published versus like you having something that's past short story length that you know is going to be published and people have like expectations and people people that you admire and respect are like hitting you up about it. It's like oh, Jesus Christ, like what? Like I have to actually I, I got to do this and. And my own expectation is I want it to be good, but also I'm like, I'm not trying to let these people down that like, you know, who I really respect and really admire. And like, for instance, like um, C.O. Clark, me and C.O. Clark have been like, uh, we've been internet friends for like a while and, and and she definitely hit me up about the book and my heart dropped. I was like, oh no, like I respect Sheree so much. And it's like, I'm being perceived and part of me like is happy to be perceived, but then the other part of me is like, no, just pretend this isn't coming out. Like, go read something else. So <laughs> that's that's kind of where I'm at with it right now. But well, I guess I'll pretend that it's not coming out, and then when it comes out, I'll be very excited with you. 
Uh, um, you know, it's I, I'm learning. I guess I have to be uncomfortable, comfortable with being uncomfortable. Like that. That's what I'm kind of learning. Yeah, growing pains, I guess. Yeah. Well, thank you for joining me today. Um, is there any last thing you wanted to add on or? Um, I'm trying to think. Any last thing? Uh, I guess anybody out there who's uh listening and you're a writer, uh, believe that you're enough. Um, believe that you're enough every day you show up to the page or to the screen or whatever. Um, no matter where you're at, don't ever let, don't ever let this industry or don't ever let anyone that like that comes at you sideways make you think that you're less. You're enough. When you put down when you put down those words, you're enough. And you know your story is important, and it will matter to somebody. So don't ever box yourself in. Sorry. So I know I said that was the last question, but there's another audience question I want to ask <laughs> real quick. Um, how would you recommend beginning writers use the story engine deck? Ah, so okay. This is awesome because I actually got to do like some live feeds with uh, Kwame um, uh, with the story deck, which was cool. Um, the way I use it is that I like to create characters out of it. So I'll do something where like there, there's actually some, if you use like the, um, I think some prompts come with it, but I use the character prompts a lot. So I'll create like two or three characters and then I'll figure out their conflict. Cause like, usually for me, I can figure out a conflict once I have like some characters in the mix. So that's how I use it. Um, what I would recommend though, if you just got the story into deck and you, you're just using it. So I had like uh, a notebook that I designated solely for writing down prompts that I made from the story deck engine. And I went through each of the prompts that the game provides and, you know, played around and figured out which one worked best for me. So that's kind of how I figured out the character prompts worked best for me because I played around with it enough. But um, I keep a journal and, you know, I keep a journal where I just write down every prompt I come up with from it. And sometimes I'll go back and like cannibalize a prompt into another story. I actually have a short story I'm working, well, two of them I'm working on that actually were born from Story Engine. So we'll see if those ever get done or if they're out there in the world. But um, that's how I would use it. Just play around with the prompts it provides at first and then figure out which one works best for you. And then, you know, go from there. And also, too. The guy um, that created it, Peter, he is so pro using the game however it works for you. He like he'll give you things to start with, but he's such an advocate of like take what you need and leave the rest out. All right, manipulate it and do what you want with it. But yeah, that's how I would start off with it. Thank you for squeezing in the last question. Um, yeah, no so thank you everyone who came out to watch. Thank you, Brent, for joining me today. Um, take care. Have a good rest of your weekend, everybody. Bye. All right, thanks for coming out.